Well, good morning, church. Let's stand. Let's sing together. can sing, it's totally okay. <laughs> You guys sound good this morning. Let me tell you, you sound good. Doesn't our band sound so great this morning? Give them a hand. Hey, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Michael. I'm the Next Gen Pastor here. Just wanted to bring you some announcements this morning. Uh, just want to say thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Whether you're here in person or online, we're so glad you decided to worship with us this morning. We hope you're having a great weekend with your family. Um, just this morning, we have a couple announcements for you. When you came in, you got a communication card. If you're, this is your first time or you're just checking us out, 
we'd love for you to put your your name and some information on there for you for us so that we can just give you a little gift that says thanks for worshiping with us this morning um if we didn't get a chance to meet you our staff and elders will meet you in the lobby after service we'd love to to get to know you um and show you our church and get you connected um this morning we have uh that communication card that we'd love for you just to fill out um and let us know you're coming to family night on wednesday night if you're coming with your family and you're going to eat dinner, let us know you're coming so we can cook for you. We'd love for you to do that before five o'clock on Monday. You also can do that on our website as well. So that is that. Our first announcement this morning is some of you have gotten these envelopes out in our lobby or you've seen our envelope wall. And if you don't know what that is, that is our next gen fundraiser. And that's for all our elementary, middle school and high school camp coming up this summer. Yes, we're super excited about that. Summer's right around the corner, which is crazy. But we're super excited about what God's going to do this summer through our church and through our next-gen ministry. If you would like to give, um, we'd love for you to go out, grab one of these, whatever number's on it. That's how much you're given. You can drop that in the box. So um, come see us afterwards. Our students will be out there. I'll be out there. Love for you to give towards that. Also, we have uh, a VBS meeting coming up uh, today after church in the FLC. If you're interested in volunteering for VBS, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, if you were a part of any VBS growing up or even last year, you know how special that is for our kids. Hey, kids, how many of you were a part of VBS? Raise your hand last year. Yes, you guys loved it, right? Oh, literally all of them. So we're super excited for that. Um, we're planning that, and if you want to be a part of that, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Also, this Saturday is our Walk for Life um, walk. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, it's for all our unborn uh, babies, and uh, Angie has a table out there in the lobby. If you will go see her after service, if you want to be a part of that, we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. And then also, our last announcement is Discovering MBCC. If you have been checking us out, this is our class to learn who we are and what we offer and what we do, and just to get to know us a little bit and for us to get to know you. So if you'd like to be a part of that, it's going to be in Steve's office. You just go out here and take a left down the hallway. It's in the back. Um, we'd love for you to be a part of that after service. So um, that's all our announcements. Um, we do have a baptism here soon. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to praise the Lord through a baptism. So let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and just what he's done on the cross for us here at New Beginnings and in this world. God, we just want to thank you for, for more decisions to follow you and say yes to a life of worshiping you more and more. God, we're so thankful for that. And God, we just ask that we can walk through life together by worshiping you more. God, thank you for this day and just let us see you more and more. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, New Beginnings. Yeah. Hey, good to see you guys again. I missed you all. It's good to be home. Uh, a week ago, I was sharing with some of you, a week ago, uh, I was in the ancient city of Philippi, Michelle and I. And uh, we were by the river where the Apostle Paul baptized Lydia and her family. You know, God is still calling families to faith. And today, we get to be a part in 2024 of God calling and saving a family. Today, I get the great opportunity to baptize three members of the Wilson family. And, uh, and this is the uh, Colin uh, Wilson and uh, Colin today is making that great decision at such a young age to follow Jesus the rest of his life. And there's no greater decision that any of us can make than to surrender our lives to following Jesus. And so for this very young man, he's making that decision and we just rejoice with this family. Uh, by the way, they're placing their membership with us today. And, uh, and so we're gonna welcome the Wilson family and, uh, and this is really, really just an awesome day of celebration uh, as we welcome them into our New Beginnings family. But more importantly, today they get to be adopted into God's eternal family. And that's the most important thing. And we give all glory to Jesus for that. I'm going to ask Colin here. Colin, would you repeat this from your heart? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Okay. Right. Want to put your nose. Colin Wilson, upon confession of your faith that Jesus is the Christ, and he is the Son of the living God, 
I now have the great joy and great honor as your older brother in the faith and your pastor to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good job, God. Hey, job, buddy. All right, here we go. Let me help you back up. Bless you, buddy. All right. All right, Declan, you ready? This is younger brother Declan. Hey, Declan. We're going There he is. Looking sharp, eh, man? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody say hey to Declan. Declan, this is everybody. You want to say hey to them? Yeah. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly he's shy. Suddenly he's shy. He was anything but shy uh, up in the dressing room a little while ago. Declan, you're making the greatest decision at such a young age, and that's to surrender your life and to follow Jesus the rest of your life. That when you become a teenager, guess what? You're going to follow Jesus. When you're a grown man, our prayer as your family is that you would continue to follow Jesus. And if it's God's will that you would be a Christian father, and that you would lead other people to Jesus with your life. Colin, would you repeat after me? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe Jesus is Lord. What's that? Declan, Declan, I'm sorry, Declan, Declan. Could I, I'd, love to, I'd love to blame it on jet lag. Um, Declan, my friend, whose name I will never, ever forget again. I now have the great honor, Declan to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You did it, buddy. You did it. You did it. <laughs> Good job, Declan. <laughs> All right. What a great morning. Amen? Take your time, Shauna. And this is Shauna Wilson. This is Mama. <laughs> yeah. I'm so grateful to the Lord for what the Lord is doing here at New Beginnings. Shauna has such a beautiful, beautiful spirit. And uh, her sweetness is just, uh, it's her reputation here in the church. And the fact that, Shauna, you are not only giving and surrendering your life to Jesus this morning, but that you and Manny are... Uh, are coming to faith and, and joining the church is something that's just so wonderful. And uh, we give the Lord all the credit for that. I'm going to ask you to, to repeat from your heart, just like I did the boys. And I do know your name. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sean, if you'd repeat this from your heart. I believe Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. I believe Jesus is Lord. Amen. Shauna Wilson, upon confession of your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I now have the great joy and the great honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> God bless you. Let's stand and sing. All right.
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And when my heart learns, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove that there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come in the wind. from 
faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. So we sing as one voice. I put my faith. Chorus, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your. Y'all can be seated. You know how easily it is that we judge others for their mistakes and their failures. Yet, you know how quickly we become bitter when someone else sins against us. God notices our sin. He sees how we hurt others. He sees how we hide and we lie to cover up our shame and our guilt. He sees how quickly we judge. He sees the bitterness that takes root in our hearts when we're hurt. When God sees our sin, he does not respond with judgment or bitterness as we do. Instead, he looks to Jesus' work on the cross. Every sin the hidden, the hurtful, the big, the small, was taken care of when Jesus went to the cross. John 129 reads, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we are confronted with our sins or the sins of others, we can look to the cross also. Instead of defining ourselves and others by our mistakes and failures, we can define each other by Jesus' perfect work. When sin leaves us hurt and disillusioned, we can turn our eyes upon Jesus, who brought redemption and peace through his death. Today we take communion together, and we remember Isaiah 50, uh, 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that wrought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. As we eat and we drink this morning from the communion cup, let us not focus on ourselves or others. Instead, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning just to remember the sacrifice that Jesus did for each one of us. We come to just to celebrate not only his death and his resurrection, but to how he was born a, a human on this earth, how he walked this earth as a man, and how he taught and he, he was sacrificed for us. This morning, I ask that you bless these emblems. The bread which represents the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross that day. And bless the juice that represents the blood that he shed for each one of us. I pray this in Jesus' name.
What a great morning. Three baptisms and the praise of songs this morning. It was just super to be here. You know, this year we've been concentrating on a campaign to just say yes campaign to worship. When I think of worship, I think of our weekly services, the singing, the meditation, the message. And also I think of the Bible studies and, and personal time that I spend in prayer. Worship includes our whole being, in which we worship in spirit with our hearts, and we worship in truth with our minds. With regard to giving, A.W. Tozer had said that worship is also living. And in our Bible, we find that worship not only to be singing, but doing and living, and walking, and working, and going, and serving. Certainly, we can worship God with our feet by going the right way. We can worship God with our hands by doing the right thing. God has already blessed us with financial resources to live our lives. But by giving our tithes and our offerings, we praise God in the act of worship. The emphasis is not on money. The emphasis is on our hearts. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you were to examine your heart towards giving financially to the church, what would you find? Do you feel joy? Do you feel excitement? Greed? Self-centeredness? Anxiety? Do you feel fear or something else? Rather than focusing on what you were giving up, Focus on your giving as an act of worship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come again this morning to give thanks. Thanks for the many blessings that you give us, and we continue day after day, week after week, to be blessed. I thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us, the, the air that we breathe, this church. I especially give thanks for the, the congregation this morning, Lord, that come out to worship you. I give thanks to the three baptisms that we had this morning. This morning. Lord, you just continue to be good with us. I ask that you bless these times and offerings this morning that, that they're used to further your kingdom and to spread word about you throughout South Tampa. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks a million, Rick. Well, again, good morning, everybody. I said good morning, everybody. Oh, yeah. That sounds, that sounds like new beginnings right there. Hey, it's good to see each and every one of you today. It's good to be home. I missed you all, and uh, we have been away. We've been away for a couple of weeks, and uh, we went out there, and uh, we went to Greece, which was amazing. We went to many of the islands of Greece. How, who's been to Greece before? You would uh, echo that. It is an amazing place, right? Uh, we ended up on, uh, in western Turkey. We went to some biblical sites there. And uh, it was just an amazing time. People have asked me how it was. I tell them, everybody just needs to go to Greece. Save your money, go to Greece. And uh, I can tell you that it has deepened me in several ways. Uh, it's deepened my appreciation for the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul put in a whole lot of hours, uh, a whole lot of walking, a whole lot of sea travel. And uh, he had none of the benefits of a uh, midnight creme brulee bar that we had and uh he uh he had an amazing journey and my my respect for the apostle paul just went to just a stra uh, stratospherically high level it also deepened my understanding of god's word uh i will never ever read acts chapter uh 16 through 21 the same way again uh, I will never, ever uh, be able to read the epistles the same way again after what I've experienced and the things that we've learned. So, uh, yes, there was a lot of enjoyment, a lot of R&R, &R, a wonderful time to just have that time with my beautiful wife, Michelle, but also the benefit, the win-win of, uh, of just drawing closer to the Lord. And uh, I pray that over the next uh, years together, I pray if that's God's will, that, uh, that your understanding will only deepen because God was gracious enough to let us go. Um, I just want to stop and I want to thank Michael and I want to stop and thank Derek for uh, covering the, the preaching while I was gone. And uh, yeah, <laughs> want to thank our amazing staff, want to thank the elders of the church and our wonderful deacons. It was such a blessing to be able to just tag out for a, a few weeks and to know that the church is in such amazing hands. And so thank you to, uh, to all of those who uh, who covered our bases there. It was just uh, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Want to uh, welcome and introduce you to two of our dear friends from Northern California who are in town with us today. Mike and Wendy Gray from Northern California. Make them feel welcome. They're awesome. 
They're awesome, and uh, it's just, we love you guys. It's so good uh, to have you with us today. Question I want to come out of the box with today, and I think it's a pretty simple one, is what does real worship look like? What does real worship look like? Let me just kind of spitball and just throw some things out there into the atmosphere. Is real worship just done by professionals, professional priests and clergy who preside? Is real worship just the, the musical style? Is it, is it hymns only? Is it praise choruses only? Is it somehow a, a combination of both? Does real worship incorporate instruments or is it just voices only? When you think of real worship, does it involve like starch collars and, and, and robes and does it involve ties and long dresses and certain hairstyles or is it come as you are? Yeah, can we just do whatever we want to do when it comes to worship, real worship, or is there a form or is there an objective to our worship together? They were as different as different could be. He was a man. She was a woman. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan, which was not the best demographic if you were a Jew. He was someone who was forming a following. He was known for his holiness. She was known for her sin. She was known for her ostracization. She was known to be a liability to this village, the village of Sychar. And on one day, like any other day, something happens. Oftentimes, the most profound things happen out of the blue. It, it's the stuff we don't plan. It's the stuff we never saw coming. And suddenly these things blow up, and, and it was just another day. It was another day for him, and just another day for her. But it's a day 2,000 years later that you and I get to metabolize together in this year of say yes, and specifically saying yes to worship. They were as different as different could be. One thing that they had in common, water. He was thirsty. He wanted some. She had come out to fetch water. It was the, the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, which tells us a whole lot. All of the women who came and they fetched water there from Jacob's well, they would come in the early hours when it was nice and cool, but here she is coming at midday in the hottest part of the day, and that tells us a whole lot about who she is and how others are holding her at arm's distance. Jesus asked her, will you give me a drink? And from that very, very simple question, one of the most profound conversations and interactions on the subject of worship in the New Testament suddenly evolves. Jesus, because of his love for her, says to her, I know your story. How many of you know today that God knows your story completely? He knows the good. Aren't you glad he knows the good? He knows the bad? Oh, wow. <laughs> And he knows the ugly, doesn't he? And he loves us anyway. And he begins this dialogue with her, and he, he tells her, hey, I, I know your story. I know that you've been divorced five times. And I know right now in your current living situation that you are shacking up. You're living, you're cohabitating with somebody you're not married to. What's it like when the hot light of God's conviction just lands on you? What do we do? How do we respond to that? Well, she did what any one of us would do if we were starting to feel that heat in the kitchen. We would begin subjects talking about either politics or religion to get that heat off of her. She chooses the subject of religion. She begins a religious debate. With that said, if you're willing, if you're able, if you can, would you stand with me and let's read this text together. It comes out of John, John chapter 4, beginning with verse 19. 
Give it good energy. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation, I'll finish it for you, comes from the Jews, verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Whoa. You may be seated. Jesus was not spooked. Jesus was not thrown by her beginning a religious debate. You're really too close to me. You know too much about me. You know too much about my present. You know too much about my past. And so let's talk about how you and I are different. It's obvious you're a holy man. You're a prophet. And so let's get this settled right now. Perhaps you know something I don't. We worship here. You worship there. Who's the true worshipers here? And Jesus said there is a day coming when it won't be here or there but that God the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship him, how? In spirit and in truth. In other words, Jesus here is explaining to her that when it comes to real worship, none of the externals or styles matter that much, but that worship ultimately and fundamentally has to do with the heart. He said that God the Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship him how in spirit and in the truth so what does that mean if you've been a christian for a minute and a half you've heard that when somebody comes to know christ and they're beginning to read the bible for the first time over and over again i've done it now in my almost 30 years of doing this i always say go to the book of john reads easy illuminates the majesty of Christ. You get these big parts of John. It obviously has the, the, the trials. It has the, the crucifixion. It has the resurrection. It has a, a whole lot of the, the theology of Jesus Christ. And so begin in the book of John, that this is important to, to start there. And if you've been in that book and you've read this specifically, you've read this before. God is looking for true Worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But what does that mean? Stop and think about that for a minute. Perhaps today, perhaps this week, maybe tomorrow, somebody will ask you, hey, how was worship yesterday? Our responses will vary. Why? Because most often we default to what happened up here a little while ago, what will happen after a 61-year-old man stops talking and doing all this. We, we think about the music. And so when somebody asks you, hey, how was, how was worship today at New Beginnings? You might, and again, I'm just spitballing, you, you might respond with, oh, man, it was hot. Man, it was moving. To quote my older kids, it was a vibe. We didn't say that when I grew up. Um, it was sedate. It was very re reflective. We're going to come up with all kinds of evaluations. We're going to assign different adjectives to what we're doing here today or what we've already done today. But what's interesting about that is that in John's gospel, spirit and truth are persons, and they're not adjectives. They're persons, and they're not adjectives. Let me, let me just kind of unpack that a little bit. In John's gospel, Jesus is identified as the embodiment of truth. Jesus himself said that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the embodiment of truth. He created all things. 
When we read in John chapter 1 that all things were created by him, in Colossians chapter 1 we read that all things were made by him and ultimately for him, that as you create, as you begin, it's through your wisdom, you are the, the embodiment, you are the encapsulation of truth, and Jesus doesn't deny that. We see that in other places in the book of John. We see it in John 1.14, in John 1.17, uh, John 5.33, John 7.18, John 8.32. And so Jesus is the embodiment and the encapsulation of all truth. Not only is Jesus truth, Jesus will always tell you the truth. That's why when we're in a situation, we don't know whether to go left or right, whatever, we need to go to the truth. Why? Because he is the truth, the embodiment of truth, and he says it himself. But likewise, listen, the Holy Spirit is identified in several places in John specifically as the spirit of truth. In John 14, 17, 15, 26, and 16, verse 13. And so here John is helping us. He's saying that when we worship him in spirit and in truth, we're not just assigning adjectives. We're not just giving a grade, oh, it was really good today, or, you know, eh, it was okay. Instead, John here, the Word of God is saying that, that this is done through the people who are in the Trinity. And so what does all that mean? What does all that mean as it pertains to, to the worship of God the Father, the kind of worshipers that God is seeking? How many of you would say, I want to be one of those worshipers? I want to be that kind of worshiper. There's a lot of people worshiping something. You may remember from my first message in this worship series, we're all created to worship, and we're all worshiping something. It's the truth, right? Look at our time, look at our talents, look at our resources. Uh, Rick just said it. Man, where, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. And so all of us, everybody in this church and outside of this church, are worshiping something. We all were born with the capacity to worship. And, and here we find that Jesus here, according to Jesus himself, says that there's a time coming when the truth and the spirit of truth are going to coalesce. And so what kind of worshiper is that? Here's the answer. That in Christian worship, we honor the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. We just got quiet. In Christian worship, that's why we're here, right? This is Christian worship, right? Uh, three of you, good. This is Christian worship. We honor the Father, right, through Jesus the Son by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let me unpack that a little bit because you guys got real quiet on me. That without Jesus, we don't have a clear view of God the Father. Okay? Unpack it more. That without the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, we don't have the heart of Jesus. I need to unpack it some more. You're still too quiet. You're looking at me like, okay, uh, you seem to know what you're talking about. Nothing's landing with me. It's through the Holy Spirit that we get to revere Jesus. And it's through Jesus that we revere the Father. In other words, Jesus here is predicting in this most unlikely place with this most unlikely person at Jacob's well in Sachar, he's telling the Samaritan woman, there's a day coming, and the day's already started. Why? Because I'm here. Because I'm God. Because I'm Emmanuel. I'm God with us. He said there's a day coming when all three members of the Trinity will coalesce in the lives of Christians and this will all be made possible. How? Listen, through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Through him and through him alone, the Trinity will come and we will make our home in them and with them. That as we are in each other, they will be in us and us in them. Sound familiar? That's John 17. And so here we find there's a new day coming. What about all that Old Testament worship? Well, that was important. Why? Because that Old Testament worship was a picture, and it was a foreshadowing that pointed towards a new day and pointed towards a new reality that you and I, listen, get to experience through rebirth. And that only comes through Jesus Christ, John 3, 
to verse 3. Jesus said, I'm here, and it's a new day. There's a new sheriff in town. All those things pointed towards me, and I am the one who, through faith in me, brings the Holy Spirit. And real worship, spirit and truth worship, is to honor the Father through Christ the Son, and the only way we get to do that is by the Holy Spirit. In our text today, John used the word worship. He used the word proskoneia. Say it with me, proskoneia. You just spoke ancient Koine Greek, the, the language that the New Testament is written in. The word worship, proskoneia, is found in the New Testament 60 times. What's interesting in that, if you like to geek out on things like this, like I do, it is a combination of two words. The first word, as we're talking about worship here, is this, to kiss toward. To kiss toward. In other words, this would be the reaction if a king, if a monarch, if somebody that you held in the highest esteem was passing by, and they're not going to stop for you, but you want to show them your affection. Or the affection of two people that are leaving each other. And, 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 and they're, what are they doing? They're blowing each other kisses, right? They're blowing each other kisses. And so worship is you and I, true worship, is us kissing toward God. He's a, a God that we revere and we love who first loved us. And so we are, we are, mwah, mwah, mwah. was that your worship today? Any of that? Well, I don't know. I don't like, well, I'm just here for the preaching. I'm just here for that. No, no. You came here to kiss toward because that's the only worship that God the Father receives. I'm here to kiss toward him. But there's a second part to proskuneia, and that is to bow. That is to bow no less, listen, than 20 times. And that means reverence. And so true worship, the kind of worship the Father is seeking is a combination of you and I, mwah, and, and both of those pistons fire in the worship engine. Well, I just, like the, I just like the kissing part. Well, you know what? You need to bow, too. Why? Because God is worthy of our reverence. Why? Jesus said that God the Father is spirit, and he's seeking true worshipers. And true worship comes only, did I mention only? through recognizing God's high and exalted position. That's why we did, just lifting the hood of the en and letting you look in the engine, that's why we began this year of saying yes, saying yes to God-ordained opportunities, talking about saying yes to abiding, talking about the characteristics, the attributes of God. Why? Because when you know all those things about God, when you have a good theology, a sound foundation theology, guess what? It's easy then to worship him. You recognize there is no one else like God. There is no one else like, like God. If, if I know the God of the Bible, I, th there ain't nobody like him. I've known some loving people, but the only people that have really loved it have also have some conditions. I, I know some good people, but, but he is always good. He is a God who, who practices justice and wrath perfectly and in proportion. The more I read the Bible, the more I recognize God is in a class exclusive. And I am not in that class. There is God and there are created things. There is creator and there are created things. And guess what? You and I is smart and handsome and good looking. And I love what you did with your hair today. You and I are in the created level. There is God and everybody else. And this God is worthy of worship. He is awe-inspiring. He is holy. He is majestic in all his ways. He is wise. He is sovereign. He is our, our king, and he is our, our Lord. He's not to be toyed with. He's not to be minimized. He, he, he's not to, to be overlooked in any kind of way. He's not to be ignored. So therefore, therefore, the true litmus test, the truest evaluation, friends, listen, when it comes to worship, is not how many hands are lifted high. The truest litmus test of worship, according to 
Jesus, anybody interested in what Jesus said today? Is not how many hands are lifted high, but how many heads are bowed low. Did you come to blow him a kiss today? Did you come in here with an understanding, even in the most fundamental, even in the most primary way, that you don't belong here? I don't deserve this. I don't, des I, I don't deserve to be in the family of God. I, I certainly don't deserve to do this. Some of you would say amen to that. I, I, I've done nothing good enough to have the hope I have. Don't look at me so religious, neither of you. I shouldn't have this kind of hope. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have this kind of assurance. I shouldn't have this kind of love and friendship around me. I, I certainly shouldn't have the mercy I've received. I don't deserve this on my best day. I do not in any way merit having a seat at God's table. I don't. And listen, when you and I get a lasso around that and we come into the house of God on a Sunday morning, guess what? That's, that's when the world will experience Jesus Christ because we recognize I don't deserve to be here. He did it all. Jesus paid it all. And so when it comes to true worship, we, we seem to have it all wrong. Instead of saying, you know, worship was, was hot or moving or worship was a vibe or <laughs> worship was sedate or worship was reflective. Why, why? Because holy fear places God on the throne and it keeps him there. How many of you know whether we put him on the throne of our hearts or not, he is on the throne? And he is not moved. There may be bicycles made for two, but there is a throne only made for one. And he sits high and exalted. He is sovereign. He is transcendent. He is above all. He is absolutely over all. And it is our privilege. Not I have to go worship. I get to worship. There's a difference there. Did you come in with that attitude today, not only to blow kisses and to bow your head in reverence, but, but did you come in here just, just ready to just give him your, your all? We see examples in the scripture where, where some people actually got to see him on his throne. Can you imagine? Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah chapter 6 got a glimpse of God on his throne. You know his response? Yeah, he's pretty cool. Jesus is my homeboy. You know how, John, how Isaiah, after he saw him on his throne with creatures around him and smoke and all that, guess what his response was? Whoa! Woe is me! And immediately when he sees him as he rightly is, to be loved, mwah, and to be feared. It changes him forever. He recognizes under the bright lights of his purity and holiness, he immediately is very, very aware, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. In other words, he's nothing like me, and I need cleaning. We, we, we read about John and Revelation chapter 4, the apostle God, uh, John gets a, a glimpse of, of God, and he falls over like a dead man. Paul, the apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul got a glimpse of God on his throne. And in all three cases, each one of those gentlemen was left in utter awe. There was nothing left. Oh, man, I, I wish God would talk to me. He has. Pick up your Bible and read left or right. He's already talked to you. You don't want the living God, a, a consuming fire talking to you. He is holy, and he has made himself known through Jesus Christ. 
See, true worship honors God in our hearts. And, and honoring God in our hearts means living every day with the right picture, the right perception of God, his majesty and his holiness, his high and exalted. He's reigning and ruling, and he's sovereign and he's almighty. And that's not just a Sunday thing. That's a 24-7 thing. Because he doesn't take the day off. He's immutable. He says in Malachi that he's the God who does not change. And as much as we make of him this day, and he deserves all of our mwah and all of our uh, guess what? He'll be the same on Wednesday when you wake up. He'll be the same next Saturday morning because he changes not. He is worthy of true worship all the time. Some of you might be saying, well, how do I do that practically? Remember, we were talking about, and Jesus here said, that he is to be worshipped by true worshipers. God is looking. He's looking across the earth. He's looking to and fro for those who are true worshipers. That true worship is founded in the personalities of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so how do I do that, Steve? First is this, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. 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 Some of you are saying, Steve, I'm one of those, I, I walk by sight, not by faith, guys. Yeah. You need to believe. There's only one way to come to, to Christ is to, is to believe. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, how are they going to believe if no one preaches to them? That's what I'm doing right now. With the best in me, with the best of how God created me, with the best of my Smoky Mountain Bible College education and 30 years of experience, my heart is to convince you today to stop believing in yourself and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to take that Oprah philosophy. You know what? There's a, there's a champion in me that just needs to get out. That's not Bible. <laughs> no, there is a champion, and you're not him, and I'm not him. There's nothing good in me. And the only goodness that you experience is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. Today, some of you are struggling with believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the first step. If you want to be a true worshiper, the kind that as God looks to and fro across the earth, who is truly worshiping me the way I deserve to be worshipped, it begins, I've got to believe in Jesus. Here's the second thing, is I need to repent of my old ways. So many people are just trying to somehow straddle a fence that isn't there. How in the world, how in the world do I appease this holy God and live the way I really want to? Is there a gray area that I can somehow navigate? We're always looking for loopholes, aren't we? We're always looking for ways to skip the long line, right? <laughs> because we're impatient. We're always looking, there's another way, there's a better way. How in the world? Maybe Jesus left something out. Maybe the Bible left something out there. And maybe there's a way that I can still be accepted by a holy God and yet not change. Still keep the the same habits and, and the same vices that I've always petted and, and pet the same devils that I've always petted. Scripture says, man, to be a, a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. And that means that you and I not only have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you just heard it from three voices a little while ago, is that I need to be willing to recognize that the road I'm on is no road at all. It is a dead end. It's destruction. And I'm turning my back on the world. I'm going in a new direction. Though none go with me. That was weak. <laughs> Still I will follow. Right? You got that kind of faith today? There's not too many people going with me. There's a lot of people going through the wide gate. But you know what? I'm putting it all on the narrow gate. I'm going to walk that road that leads to heaven. I'm going to walk the road that pleases this holy God. How about this one? I'm going to be immersed in baptism. 
Thank you, Wilsons, for being my sermon illustration today. It's a great decision. Not only was Jesus baptized, Jesus in the Great Commission tells us to go out and baptize people. In the book of Acts, this book that just really came super alive, in my understanding, the last two weeks, actually being at these, these sites, uh, that, that, that over 13 examples in, in the book of Acts alone were people who gave their hearts to Jesus Christ, even that very hour said, where's water? Like the Ethiopian official, here's water, what's preventing me from being baptized? Baptism is important. Over 30 years, I've heard people who, who want to know the whys, who want to know the what ifs, right? What, 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 Will I be saved if I don't get baptized? And do I get the Holy Spirit? And we're always, we're always trying to look for the, we're always trying to lift the hood and, and get in the engine. And does this connect with this? And what if I leave that part out? Will the, will the car still run? Or, you know, and I get that. We're meaning machines as human beings. But let me challenge you today. That's God's business. God's the perfect and righteous judge. Close the hood, take 12 big steps backwards, and just look at the beauty of the gift in the car that God gave you. It's not in the mechanics. I'm not saying those things are, aren't, aren't important. But some of us, we need to get baptized. And today, even some children led us in that good, good example. How about this one? As we're talking about being true worshipers, a, a foundation of true worship is intentionally and aggressively fill our life with his truth. Friends, we need to read our Bibles. We need to read our Bibles. It was uh, my good pleasure uh, the few days before I left. I went to, uh, went to the barber, and I've been having um, really great conversations with him recently. And I love this guy. I, I appreciate him so much. He's from South Tampa. He's from the Robinson High School area, and his parents are... Uh, are uh, both from Vietnam, and he is just so community-minded. He does book bag drives before school. Uh, he does bike giveaways at Christmas. Uh, he does free haircuts for, for kids that are going back to school and stuff. He's just this precious heart, and yet he doesn't know Jesus. And so I got in the chair a couple of weeks ago, and I just asked him the simple question. I asked him, I said, do you even own a Bible? He said, nobody's given me a Bible. I got on the phone with Michelle. We got to get him a Bible. And my faithful wife, we got him a good Bible. We were able to give him that Bible and be able to instruct him, hey, why don't you start here? And if you have any questions, and here's my business card and whatever, and I'm going to follow up with that. And, and, and he's hungry. He's hungry to know more. He's hungry to, to absorb what God has for him in his life. He knows he is blessed. And he acknowledged he's blessed, but he doesn't know the open hand that has surrendered blessings into his life. And so we pray for him, as we pray for many, that they would put that together and that you and I would fill our lives with God's truth. Let me give you a couple more, that we would engage God's family and that we would serve. We need each other. You've heard me say that many times in my almost five years of being back with you. I need you guys. I need you. You know what? Pastors get discouraged now and then. I hate to admit that. You think a guy this long in doing this would have it all together, and I don't. There's many times I'm weak-kneed. There's many times that something comes out of the blue. The enemy's trying so much to discourage me, and I need your encouragement. There's times where I need discipline, and God's very faithful to do that. But we need each other. This is a family. This is a family. You've been bought with a price. And we're spiritual siblings, and we need each other in this thing. Scripture says that in Hebrews that, that we need to be getting together more and more and more and more and more and more. Why? Hebrew writer says that as that day approaches, what day? That Jesus is coming back. We need to be getting together. We need to be encouraging. Hey, don't, don't stop now. Don't stop. It, it, you're too close, man. We're too close, man. We're too close. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's going to be worth it. You hang in there. Don't you give up. Don't you dare give up. I need you. And not just for the encouragement, but 
you were created to serve. And God's entrusted spiritual giftedness to each and every one of you called on the name of the Lord. And here's what I know. There's a lot I don't know, but this much I do know is there's a day coming where you're going to be held accountable for the giftedness that God has given you. Many of us have grown up in this church and you have no idea what your spiritual gifts are. That's a really sad thing because someday you're going to stand before God and he's going to ask you two questions. What did you do with Jesus, my son, and what did you do with the gifts I gave him? I don't even know what my spiritual gifts are. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. So we need to be part of the family of God just as the Wilson family said, hey, we want to be part of this crazy family called New Beginnings. But you know what? With that also comes the expectation they're going to serve. No bench sitters family of God. Lastly, surrender every day to his love and will. Every day is surrender. Every day. Oh, I'm an American. I don't like the word surrender. No, that's what this life is about. Every day I'm surrendering to his will. Lord, I I know what I want to do today. I've got a to-do list. I've got some things I'd love to check off by the time I lay my head on my pillow tonight. But God, this is is your business. This is your world. This is your commission. This is your life. My life is no longer mine. You bought me at a great price. And even if I don't get to check off an accomplishment today, let's do what you want to do. Because what you want to do, you do it with me. And you give me the power and you give me the guidance to do it. Father knows best. Friends, you were made to be the kind of worshiper God is seeking. And the million dollar question is, are you? And the good news is, you can be. You can be. You were made to worship. You were made to worship. Sometimes in a church setting like this, we see people who raise their hands and no, no worship Gestapo here. But sometimes we'll see people raise their hands. And, and you know what? That's a precious thing. That's not our job to judge anybody when it comes to their physical expressions. But you know what? There's also times where I see you and your head is bowed. Sometimes you're blowing kisses or praise, and sometimes you are keenly aware Oh my gosh, he's right. I don't deserve to be here and to have the assurance that I have in Jesus Christ. And both of those things are our worship. A young lady went to church one Sunday morning. She went home and her elderly grandfather was waiting to hear how church went. How was it, honey? He said, oh, Grandpa, we sang. Oh, man, did we sing. Grandpa said, that's good. Sing loud. Oh, Grandpa, we even danced a little bit. Grandpa said, honey, dance is good. Dance with all your might, just like David. Grandpa, we, we even jumped a little bit. Grandpa said, jump, honey. Jump high. But when you land, walk straight. This is what worship is all about. This is what worship is all about. Whether you raise your hands or not, whether you're blowing a kiss or not, God is worthy of your worship today. God alone. I don't deserve it. As sweet as you are, you don't deserve it. But there's a God in heaven who is. And scripture says someday we're going to meet him. And you and I will get to worship him throughout eternity. I don't know what that looks like, but I know it's going to be really, really amazing. And I want us to do it together. I love you guys. I want us to move this party upstairs, man. And what's it going to look like? when we see him as he is. And, and Paul, and the scripture tells us that we will see him, and we will see him as a lamb who was slain. And throughout eternity, we will see Christ, and he will bear crucifixion marks. And throughout eternity, we will recognize, I really don't belong here. 
Scripture says that there are elders there who are wearing crowns that have been assigned to them. And what they do continuously is take their crowns and throw them down. I'm unworthy to wear this. But he is. And yet somehow the crowns just keep ending up back on their heads. He's going to share his glory with us. Oh my, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. Father, we love you so much. You alone are worthy. You deserve our best kisses. Forgive us for the times that we don't see you high and exalted. God, help us to be the people that you're seeking. And Father, we recognize that only comes through Jesus the Son. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today or maybe somebody who's watching online that has not made the decision to, to surrender, to believe, to turn their back on the world, to say yes to Jesus, to be waterly baptized, to, to begin a new walk and a new relationship with you. God, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Father, I pray that as you look down, you would see the people of New Beginnings Christian Church who absolutely love you and adore you. You're worthy. You're worthy. We thank you for the one who came and told us what real worship is all about. Who knows all of our sins as we sit by Jacob's well. He who loves us anyway. Who died for us anyway. Who raised, rose from the grave anyway. Thank you for that. We love you. Thank you for the privilege we get to worship you. In Jesus' name. I've got some friends uh, who'd love to pray with you today. And uh, we all need prayer for something, don't we? Oh, I don't need any prayer. Oh, that, that tells me you need prayer. <laughs> but I want to introduce you to some of my friends, and I introduce you to these folks every week. And that's because they love you. It's because they, they love to pray for people. And, uh, and, and I want to introduce you to Rick Rose. I want to introduce you to Melody Rodriguez. Uh, I want to introduce you to Johnny Hartman. Uh, and, and these are people that care about you. These are people who will pray for you uh, no matter what it is. Uh, these are people that will pray for you throughout the week ahead. If you want, they'll, they'll ring you up and, hey, how you doing? And I've been thinking about you, been praying for you this week. And, and, and we all need prayer in one way or the other. And, and so don't leave here without getting prayed for today. If there's somebody here today and you've never taken that step, that my friend Declan and Colin and Shauna made a little while ago, would you take that step today? You can leave this place with a brand new hope. You can, you can leave this place different than the way that you came in. And that's what Jesus Christ in our lives does. And so if you have a decision to make, why don't you make it right now while we stand together and we sing together. We're going to sing. Um, if you need to raise your hands, raise your hands. Put them out to your side. Put them out to your side. Put them in front of you. If you need to sit down, get on a knee. Do what you need to do to worship in this moment. I don't want you to worry about anybody next to you, behind you, in front of you. They don't matter in this moment. It's between you and the Father. That is it. Whether you can sing great or sing bad, it doesn't matter because regardless, it is a sweet sound to his ear. So let's sing like we mean it. Let's pray like we mean it. Let's repent like we mean it.
So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to this earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. We sing in one voice. So he Yeah, sing. To see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs. more time hear him to worship Father God, we, we love you. We thank you for your
your son. And that he is our reason to sing. We bring our worship. We bring everything, Lord. Whether it's work or, or play or good or bad or exciting or boring, whatever it is we're doing, Lord, it is all uh, in worship to you and you alone. Because there's only, only one throne, and that's yours. So no one can take you out of it. You won't give it up. Because you're the only, only one worthy to sit in that throne. So, Lord, we praise you. We pray that our worship, whether in song or scripture or work, we, I pray that it is um, honoring to you. Because you're worthy of all honor and respect and service and praise. And glory, all glory to you, Lord, and none to us. We thank you for your kindness, your goodness. We praise you for your power, your might, your strength. We praise you for your gentleness, your lowliness, and, and your love. So Lord, we lift these things to you. We praise you in your Son's name, through the power of your Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. We'll see you guys next week.